On this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast, we learn that you can't get into Son of Arts Goth Club without goat horns and a girdle. Also, getting old sucks. Let's do this. Welcome to this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast. I'm Diana. I am Liz. I was trying to be the voice of the fly that is in Diana's recording studio. Yes. Which I think may be the reincarnation of Jeff Goldblum's fly. Yeah. I mean, it'd have to be a reincarnation of his fly, but not of Jeff Goldblum because he's alive. That's weird. Because he okay. is alive. Yeah. But maybe in the time loop. Maybe. I mean, time travel is stupid, so, as you it, say, so maybe it, it could is be any stupid. of those things. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, how are you this week? I'm doing well. We are getting close to spooky season, even though it's spooky season all year here. Mm-hmm. But the temperatures have are starting to yep. not be so disgusting. They're not great, but they're not disgusting we went out to a celtic festival on sunday at the sherwood forest uh sherwood forest campgrounds it is like this permanent ren fair campground about an hour outside of austin and i only started sweating after like an hour so instead of the second you open the door instead of the second i opened the door so hooray that's good and how are you? I'm good. We um, spent a lot of time on reviving Duchess. She needed like some transfusions and some like minor major repairs. So we spent our weekend on that mostly and some household stuff as uh, I know you're getting ready to go out of town as am I. And so it's all kinds of fun with that. But yeah. That's about all I got. I don't have anything exciting. I guess it's kind of exciting. I definitely made a jean jacket with rhinestone fringe. I'm very excited about wearing it. It is epic. I'm pretty you excited. deserve your craft badge for it. Mm-hmm. I do not understand how you did not go blind or end up with rhinestones all over your floor being eaten by your dogs. Luckily, I bought the fringe where they're very well connected because I spent money on expensive ass rhinestone fringe. Oh, so you weren't like you didn't have to like oh, no. bead. I thought you it, like beaded oh, each no. of those fringes individually, oh, no. No. and I was I bought, I'm I bought still it by a... the yard. I bought the fringe by the yard. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. No, I'm not that good. Hold on now. Don't get that excited. Well, now I feel like I've let you down. Um. <laughs> you were. It's still very impressive. That's still a very hard thing to sew. Uh, I said part of it. A lot of it was actually just, I did some research. A lot of it's glue, but I did do obviously some stitching as well on it. So it's a little combination. Combination. But yeah, so uh, I got, I got, you know, getting ready to go to Nashville for a few days. I felt like it was appropriate. Fringe is always, especially rhinestone fringe is always appropriate. Are you finally going to go to the Dolly Bar? I'm going to try. It's nowhere near anything I'm doing or have to be at it's like on the other side of town from everything i'm doing it's not that it's far outside of town but i am technically there for work and when i say technically there for work i work in the music industry which means that it's like meetings during the day concerts all night and so it's super fun and exhausting americana fest Yeehaw. yeah so you're going to a concert I am going to see my favorite band, The Interrupters. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're my favorite, but they are definitely up, up there. They definitely bring me joy. And also the Skints are playing and I'm very excited to see them. They are modern ska reggae soul. <laughs> I don't know how to describe them, but they are fantastic. And Tiger Army is playing, and I haven't seen them in a minute. I cannot wait to see how Nick 13 has aged. I want to know. You'll have to tell me. So Nick 13, if you do not know, was a very attractive man. Yes. I'm sure he is still a very attractive man, but I don't know. I haven't seen him in probably 10 years, so. 
I'm, I'm I super excited and about that. I'm sure that. we could like Google image search that, but that's not nearly as much that's fun. That's not as fun. No. And the, also flogging Molly is headlining and they're great. And I, I will enjoy them, but they're not who I'm going to see. <laughs> right. I understand. So I understand so what, that for sure. So what is on your drinking plate tonight? Tonight, I... I had to buy wine at the grocery store, which I don't normally do. And to be fair, some grocery stores have a lovely selection and mine is fine. And I was buying wine that I thought I was going to have to share with my sister. So I'm giving a long excuse as to why I'm drinking the locale Kim Crawford right now. <laughs> but it's low calorie Kim Crawford. It's like in Kim Crawford Inspire or something. I don't know. Yeah. Cool. It's fine. <laughs> It is so fine. <clears throat> yeah, I like I I kind of like dug on Kim Crawford for a minute. Like it's a good summery wine, like cheap wine that's accessible. And then I got really not into it. And then I was like, oh, Andrea likes this. My my sister it really likes Kim Crawford. I was like, fine, I'll just get some of that. If we're gonna, we met up for dinner with the family yesterday, so it's fine. That's what I got. Yeah. So how about you? (laughs) uh, I am drinking a Signor and it is wildflower. And I opened it many days ago, but my vacuum seal worked because I opened, Mm -hmm. I I was like, "Uh, I don't really want to open another bottle of wine. And I'm so terrible at finishing bottles these days, which is probably a good problem to have, but not a great problem when you don't drink cheap wine. Yeah. And so this is their 2019 Rogue Valley blend. Mm -hmm. And it's Dolcetto, Barbara. Was that Barbara or Barbara? Oh, I've I've read it. I don't know how to say it. I think we've, well, well, we've heard it at, oh, no, we've heard it at Wine Things, but Barbara, Barbara and Primitivo. So Mm -hmm. it's pretty good. And I'm not letting it go to waste. Yeah, good. Good. I'm supposed to get my new my shipment soon from my wine club, but I need I miss I miss Signor. So, yeah. I yeah, I am very confused about when my next shipment is, and I should like they email me, and I just have so much shitty email. Like my junk, my email is just full of crap, and I barely look at it, even though very important things come to it. So oh. I could have just ignored the email that my shipment was ready and I will be out there at the end of October, the day before the misfits and the distillers. So I'll have a very long weekend that weekend, yeah. but I, I would like to go, you know, actually go pick it up. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll be out there in the beginning of October because high cider is having their pickup party Ooh, fun. and we're going to go do that. They're, they're super fun folks. So that'll be a good day. Yeah. I'm ready to go back there. I like it. Well, let's um, talk about season five, episode seven, the curious case of Dean Winchester. Uh, I'll just go ahead and preface before you go into it is I was message I messaged Liz like man, we message whatever all the time. That's what we do. And uh, it's like, by the way, I'm starting the episode. She's like, it's okay. It's fine. And <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Like, I'm not mad at this episode, but I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, I don't know. It's, fine. it's not a bummer. No. Like we do not rate this episode as as going to Bummer Town. No. It is highly amusing. I think we get a lot of insight into Bobby, which is good. Yes. The monster of the week are fun. They are yeah. is an attractive man, and I'm not gonna be mad at that any second. Yeah. And I love a witch, and there's two witches. Mm-hmm. But I also know the episode the next two episodes are so fucking spectacular. That it just makes this one seem fine. Okay, well, that's and that's I, a good really ho- I really, I really hope I am not letting Diana down by prepping her for <laughs> the next year. year. I hope I am, but I do not think I am overselling in the slightest. Okay, so we, I let's talk about this episode so we can get to next week. But this is not a throwaway. We've got some really great no, things to important. talk about. So this obviously, if you did not know, I'm not going to say obviously, is based on the F. Scott Fitzgerald short story, which was later made into a movie with Brad Pitt, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. 
Fun fact, have not read or seen it. Generally, I'd aware of the concept. There you go. I have read that story. Fitzgerald kind of rubs me in a you are an elite you're an elite spoiled brat way of the gilded age while it looks fun or the you know that not the gilded age but the jazz whatever fitzgerald's thing is now i sound stupid but Mm. it they are just really they're rich people and it's not that exciting oh like i hate the great gatsby so yeah yeah i hate it you're like, oh, Gatsby party. I'm like, oh, terrible people. Fun. Yeah. Oh, they, they were just you know, entitled bitches. So, uh, yeah. but obviously in the case of Benjamin Button, obviously again, but in that, yes. he, he ages backwards. Right. So that is, makes a lot of sense. This mm-hmm. was first aired on October 28th, 2009. It was directed by Robert Singer. So that is probably why, even though it was fine, like it was still a good episode. Right. The teleplay was by Sarah Gamble, and the story credit actually went to uh, her and Jenny Klein. And this was kind of, I really liked the way that the writer's room here like worked a lot. So she was an assistant writer, a PA, and gave the idea. And so she got the story credit. I think that's cool. And then she just kept working her way up and is a fucking badass. She was on Supernatural through season 11, then left to become a co-producer and writer on Jessica Jones. Then worked on Cloak and Dagger, The Tick, The Witcher, and was the executive producer and writer on The Thing About Pam. Then uh, right now, something that she has in post-production, she was a co-executive producer and writer on the miniseries Daisy Jones and the Six. Have you heard about this one? Mm -mm. It's based on a book about Daisy Jones and the Six, a rock band in the 70s music LA scene on their quest for worldwide icon status. And that will be streaming on Amazon Prime and is part of Reese Witherspoon's Hello Sunshine Media Company, hmm. which I think is just does amazing things for, for women storytellers. And so looking forward to that. That sounds great because 70s rock and roll women in LA. Could be a party. It could be a party and also just I the fa- I know the fashion, fashion. in that is going to be uh, fucking be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Stupid good. So that is our <clears throat> background on this. So what we're going to start off is a woman is reading the weekly My favorite world newspaper. news. Yes. Yes. I was pretty excited. Um, and that's sadly no longer a thing. I know. It's very mm. sad. Um, yeah, and it's uh, the cover we see is that the cover headline is that psychics agree the apocalypse is coming. I'm like, oh, fun, fun. So, uh, but there you do while she's reading this, you hear some ominous music, and a man runs into the house, and she's like, hey, babe. And but he just beelines up the stairs, like holding onto his arm. And I'm kind of like, hmm, hmm, something's wrong. And she is, but she is <laughs> not concerned at first but he's in the bathroom he's got the sink running water which i don't really know why he's got water running it's just kind of, it's kind of like a random decision at this point in time and he's looking very scared in the mirror and his hand is changing on the edge of the sink it's aging what and his eyes start turning like this his skin starts turning and his hair falls out and he gets cataracts and I really think this just reminded me of that you should not look in the mirror when you're on acid. <laughs> That's one of the rules, right? It is definitely a rule. Well, on heavy psychedelics, Don't do not look at yourself in the mirror. Mm-mm. Not no. saying that I know what that is like, but do not look at yourself in it's, the mirror. I read it in a book somewhere. Sure. I saw it on TV. Uh, I yeah, learned it by watching you. you. Not Diana, though. Not me yeah uh and then he falls to the ground in pain and so now she hears him fall and you run across the house which reminds me of a couple weeks ago when i fell in the house and dave came running for me which is really funny to me <laughs> like, yeah, and I, we funny. may have said on this we may have talked about this but diana tripped because she thought her dog was cute i was i was looking at the dog and, it was and she cute. was wearing impractical shoes well, and it caught on the edge of the rugs. I have random rugs everywhere because the dogs slip. And so you have to put rugs down on your hardwoods. It's a thing. If you have dogs, especially older dogs, you definitely understand that. And so I caught one of the, I was wearing some like big wedges and like caught the, actually I was wearing creeper, really tall creepers. That's what it was. And it caught and I rolled my ankle and I like fell and threw my coffee everywhere. Babe came running. 
Babe, you're anyway. the hero. You're the hero. <clears throat> like, so she runs, she goes running and breaks, busts into the bathroom. And uh, she just looks down at the floor and screams. But they don't show him. So we don't know what happened. We Besides that he got really old. But we don't know. And we assume what... he did. Yeah. So... But also, I don't, if I was her, how would you even... Well, it'd be really weird. Like, hey, do I know this person? Like, hey, why is this what? dead old man here? And then Diana's trying to catch a fly, and so it watch this on the YouTube, and you can see her try to be Mr. Miyagi, and I failed, failing. Um, but yeah, so I think like it's a. Uh, I thought it was weird that her reaction was a little odd, and she just yells no, like no, like that's a really weird thing to yell. What, what, but what, I mean, what would you yell? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> that's that, right. That, that is probably that's what, what I you would yell. yell. <gasps> yeah. Or who the fuck are you? <laughs> like, I don't know. Like, weird. Just in general. Um, fuck. <laughs> fuck. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I just thought that that was a weird word choice to yell. So we cut to the coroner's office in the morgue, um, or the coroner meeting with the coroner in the morgue. We've got our our Winchester brothers are there and this time they're not FBI. They are CDC. But she does not believe them because <laughs> the CDC are a government agency and therefore cannot arrive on time. And as we have learned in the past few years, maybe not the best agency. What? <laughs> what? That's silly. I know I, I'm talking crazy talk but Dean says that they have there is a new administration, new administration. a change you can believe in which I believe is an Obama reference yeah. um, and they um, so the coroner pulls Xavier's body out and it's an old man with a Y incision and they're like yeah he was uh, born in 1984 um, in the corners, like ran his DNA, DNA to make sure it's actually him and all this kind of stuff. So a male 25 died of old age. That's terrifying. It is. And I would especially want the CDC there. And then would be very upset with that. They were not actually the CDC, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're probably waiting for their three part plan and oh, they're probably oh, still waiting and not surprised. All right. So the brothers are leaving. They're they're, they're going to call Bobby. They're like this is definitely a job, but there's only one body so far, um, and there's just a few missing persons in town, but nothing unusual for a town of this size. So they're going to go, but they're going to investigate him anyways. And then kind of tries to ask how Bobby's doing, and Bobby's like real like, I'm not saying I blame him, so don't say that. I'm going to kind of be like, but he's real salty. He's like, what my legs? I'm just weeping in my Hagen Dazs, idiot. But then they show him, and he looks real sad. He does. So we know it's a front that he's just trying to play it off with snark. I get it. It's a defense mechanism, Bobby. You look sad and I am concerned. And yeah. throughout this episode, my concern yeah. for Bobby grows. Correct. So we cut to our brothers, um, the, the Winchester brothers, um, talking to an older woman in her living room. What and brothers would you be talking about? Well, I know. I, just I like, like that you had to clarify I'm... that it was the Winchester brothers. I mean, I don't know. I just feel like it's not the like... Hanson brothers. No. Although I would like to see the Hanson brothers. The Wilson in... brothers. I mean, come on now. Well, the Wilson brothers got that would be interesting, too. I know. Yeah. Especially today. Oh, oh. very. Hmm. Very. Um. But anyway, so, um, but she's showing them a photo of her missing husband and he has a very, an older gentleman has a very distinct, uh, USMC, um, tattoo on his forearm. And she's like, got some like story about how he always certain days, one day a week he works late or whatever. And Dean manages to sneak around the house like you do and finds a receipt from Madame Lynn's golden palace. Lou. Oh, Lou. Sorry. It's okay. Lou's golden palace. Yeah. And uh, so they they know where they're off to next. And uh, the good old husband was definitely lying about working late. He was. And we do know that it was $250. It does look like he tipped. So I do appreciate that. You should always tip your service industry. We do then go to Madame Blue's and I will hope. No, I'm just going to say this now. They over-sexualize Asian women on the show far too often. And 
this is going to be enough. This already, we already know by the name Madame Blues, yeah. this is an example of that. Yeah. And just very cognizant, I think, after the Chinese basket thing, because I looked at that all weekend and it was like, man, that's also fetishizing, you know, the Asian women. And I was like, yeah, damn it. This sh-. And then so now I just roll my and eyes. Dean's and Dean's favorite magazine. Yeah. And Busty Asian Beauties. And yeah. So, however, Madame Blues looks like a lovely bordello and I would yes. like to go visit it. It did look like a lovely establishment. It did. And pretty secure and, and clean, well kept, well decorated. But, you know, at least, you nice. know, it looks like a nice place to work. Oh. Sure. So, um, Sam and Dean go up to the door that of the room because apparently this gentleman had his regular room. And uh, they are like, oh, we're going to walk in on some wrinkly, gooey corpse. Ew. But no, right as they're about to pick the lock, they hear yelling in the room. So they bust in. And it's a youngish man with two women. Yep. So the oh, also he was yelling, "Oh no!" He did so, yell like, "No, don't!" or something like that. So, so what were they yelling. doing to him? I, I mean, maybe that was his role play, but I would also be concerned. Yeah. So they break in, but then they're like, "Oh, all embarrassed," and the women are running off, and they think they have the wrong room until they notice the same USMC tattoo. Hmm. And they ask, do you know Cliff Whitlow? And he lies, but they find his wallet. So it's pretty fucking obvious. And uh, yeah, it's. And Dean like weirdly looks under the blanket to look for a birthmark that the wife told him about, supposedly. I think he's lying and being weird. You think Dean just wanted to look at his dick? Yes. I, I think, think he, he was, was just look- nosy. I think he was looking for a birthmark. I don't okay. think Dean just wanted to get a junk, pe- junk peep. I mean, he maybe he was trying to see why the girl, why he was yelling at the girls to stop. I don't know. Anyways, um, but so we find out this gentleman's name is Cliff. It is actually Cliff, the man who is missing, and he's like begging them to not tell his wife, basically. And they're like, okay, well, we'll we won't tell your wife if you tell us how the fuck this happened. And he's like, no, no, no. And they're like, man, he's like, no, okay, fine. I'll tell you. And it's a game, a high stakes poker. And you play for years. This guy just shows up to him at a bar and gives him chips, chants over them and says they're worth 25 years. And they play poker for years of your life, which is fascinating and terrifying. But anyways, I guess if you were a, an aging person, I mean, people are always face, you know, chasing eternal youth. That this may seem like a good point, but also Clifford then was a very attractive young man. Yes, you put poison in your face. <laughs> I'm like chasing youth. Yes, more botulism, please. <laughs> but so yeah. Cliff, like, actually was lucky or good at cards, and so he. This is how he got young because he won, and he's also just like I don't know what's going on, but this is great. One of those mm-hmm. ladies I didn't even have to pay for. He got he got a hookup, yeah, or something, or something. And he gives him a loose description of the guy from the bar that they played poker with as thirty five ish, brown hair, Irish accent, and. You can't, Go they, on, they move, and they move around a lot, so he kind of finds you. But did you just name my type? Thank you. <laughs> so they um, they leave, and Dean's talking to Bobby again, and Bobby's like, "Yeah, this lore goes back centuries about a card player. You beat him, and you get your best years back, but most folks lose." And this is one of those situations where. If this is true, it is very difficult to find. I did mm-hmm. not find it, but also it is very hard to internet search for poker. Yeah. Because poker and yeah. card games, because card games and just a very different, difficult Boolean search. And I did not find anything. It, it sounds logical. And it sounds like a story I feel like I have may have heard, but I also think I just because of the show. Yeah, it could be. It wasn't a lore that I that I had any familiarity with. And I'm not saying I know all of the backstories, but you know, there's usually some bit of like, like something like rings to it. a bell. It's yeah. So, so I think that I think they just made that up. 
but a good story so, if not yeah i would believe and, it and so sam and dean are off searching dive bars trying to find someone that's going to try to invite them to play poker and we show bobby eyeballing a set of keys uh oh so um when they're about to give up dean gives his food order to sam and like yeah, i'll meet you back at the hotel and basically goes and totally bribes a bartender in his last ditch effort and succeeds in finding the location of the card game the funny thing is is that bribe it still got me it took me a minute to be like who the fuck is bill like why are you looking for a bill and i could see why the bartender was also like i don't know i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> then oh it's a hundo and hundo. you're looking for benjamin oh ben hundo. ben i guess not bill he was looking for yeah. ben I, see I'm my friend ben mm-hmm. yeah my friend ben yeah but anyhow um, and so as Dean is finally going down this alleyway to get to this poker game, as he's walking up, Bobby is exiting. He found the game and he played and lost. No, Bobby, what'd you do? He lost 25 you years and you can already see it like actively aging him. Yes. And that was done mainly with like prosthetics. Okay. and makeup so really great job in the effects department mm-hmm. that it wasn't just cgi'd that you know this was actually i, I always appreciate it you know when they're like oh, yeah. we're gonna put the effort in and not just it's so e- even CGI. back then it'd be so easy to just throw that on his face so yeah so we cut to the inside of the bar where this game is supposedly happening and it's you see this <clears throat> handsome irishman talking to this couple um it's a somewhat older gentleman and a very pretty woman and um but not like can, a julia roberts pretty woman i mean no, she could have been just, a, she could have been a sex worker we don't know but no but yeah it just it, it just happened to be an attractive woman talking with standing there so it looked like they were a couple and that the irishman was pulling a kind of a, a game on him so dean interrupts and he's like mm, i'm gonna flash my gun and you're gonna come talk to me now and i really like this exchange like patrick is just like so like calm and like yep gonna go talk to my friend we're gonna go chat uh, yeah we're gonna go have a crack mm-hmm. or is and... it it's going to be a crack damn it i never get how to use crack in well i don't also don't know how to use crack but <laughs> i don't know how to use the irish version of it's a crack it's a very mm-hmm. it's a weird slang Mm-hmm. i don't know either so dean has keeps a gun on him under the table this whole time is trying to question patrick we don't know his name is patrick at this point which is very confusing in my notes we find that out later but anyways no um, we did we learned his name was patrick by the guy i thought they said they said i didn't think they said his name Maybe they did because i, I have when they were looking for an irish man named patrick i missed that but i was stressed about it but either way i know his name's patrick and he is He's like, kind of like blowing Dean off, like, oh, did I upset some woman in your life? I didn't really mean it. Huh? And he's like, uh, no, but then it's about years. And so he cocks the gun and, and Patrick's like, yeah, go ahead. I could use a good tickle. So now we know that this guy can't be shot, which is weird that he was so agreeable about going to talk to Dean at, under threat of gun, if that doesn't matter, except unless he just really didn't want to see him or to lose his mark. Or it was a bluff. All right. So we've got Patrick who's like not reactive to having a gun pointed at him. He's like, oh, I could use a tickle. So here we go. Um, He says, well, hey, why don't you play? Dean, why don't you play for years? And Bobby shows up and he's like, oh, hell no. Dean, you're not you're not going to do it. And Dean's like, well, they're my years and I can do what I want, which is actually what Bobby had lived in a few minutes before. So, And Bobby starts like hacking like coughing real bad <laughs> patrick offers a, a lozenge and it's really condescending but it was a it was a linty lozenge you know linty so <clears throat> dean does go to the poker table and bobby's gonna they're watching and he does a buy-in for 25 years and so dean says make it 50 and immediately goes to cash out 25 or after after they get the blessed or chanted or whatever the fuck gets done to them. He immediately goes and um, cashes out 25 to give to Bobby, to give Bobby his 25 back. Right. And so he chants some Gaelic over them 
and I will not attempt to pronounce Gaelic because mm. it does that sounds like Bobby hacking and mm. but the tra- an Irish person said that they were like oh we, I translated this for you so they said that it means shine brightly now um, and so as he describes it's just but we know it's showmanship but it's go you know, shine brightly now yeah mm-hmm. look at me and they catch on fire and he blows the ashes on Bobby and Bobby goes. Oh, yeah. Oh, so the second time then it says oh. light up and put out the fire. Let it be so. Huh. Okay. Well, Dean just pissed away 25 years. And so now he's got to try to win them back. And Patrick is very excited about this game. He tells Dean excited. to deal and it will be fun. And yeah, I like Patrick a lot. Dude. All right. So. They got to play, but we don't know how it's going to go. So we're going to cut to a motel. And Sam's back with dinner, which is awful nice of him. Dean comes out of the bathroom. Or is it Dean? It's an old man. What the fuck? Who that? Who that? Who that? And so Sam pulls a gun on him and doesn't believe it's him. It's pretty funny. And which then, it, uh, it seems like a good, good reflexes and instincts. Yeah. Good job, Sam. Good job. And uh, he's like, yeah, so obviously I found the game. But Sam's like, weren't you? I thought you were supposed to be good at poker. (laughs) (laughs) Womp womp. And uh, Dean says that he looks like the old chick from Titanic. But Sam thought he looked more like Emperor Palpatine. And then Bobby wheels in and says he looks like John McCain. Yeah. So we get a whole slew of elderly references. Yep, we do. And so... um, Dean tells Sam that Bobby's an idiot and they all start yelling at each other because they get the story of basically how this all came about. And um, finally, Dean, you know, admits that it must have been tempting for Bobby to want to try to get out, do this to try to get out of the chair. Because if he had gotten his years back, he could have probably gotten his legs back was the idea. But that this was a witch playing poker. It's a witch. It's a witch. It's a witch. But, and he's like, you know, Dean admits, though, because Bobby gets kind of pissed at this point. He's like, no, obviously I can't relate to actually being paralyzed, but I've been to hell and my junk's frostier than yours. And then he gets acid reflux, which he had never experienced before from his burger. And I think, you know, so, yeah, Dean probably still at the point where acid reflux does not become a thing. But as a lady in her 40s, I will tell you it's a thing. And it, it really is. sucks. And it's but it's still I'm not at the point where it happens all the time, but enough that I have a prescription. And no, I don't have that. Yeah, and but Sam also thinks that they are their bickering is like grumpy old men, and he thinks they're adorable. Because yeah. they kind of are. Yeah. But now they've decided that basically it's about, you know, they Bobby wants to solve the case. He thinks it's about the chips and he remembers perfectly the incantation. And Dean is like, uh, wants to Benjamin button himself back into burger shape because that's the most upsetting thing he's encountered so far, apparently. But he's about to encounter something else that upsets him. Yes, because the very lovely young woman working housekeeping comes to the door and Dean tries to flirt with her and she compares him to her grandfather. And he is not into that. He's not and tries to tell her that he's dangerous. And she just thinks he's cute. And she giggles at him. Very upsetting to a man if he tells you he's dangerous and you giggle at him. Just saying. Actually, to anybody. If they tell you you're, they're dangerous and you giggle at them. It's pretty upsetting. But it's also a very good defensive technique. Yeah. So we've got um, all three guys. We've got Dean, Sam, and Bobby in a... Um, in the van uh, and they are following Patrick and watching him. So how is Bobby driving? I was wondering that too. Cause he eyeballed the keys early on. And so I know there's amazing modifications for people that are paralyzed to drive. And I am just saying that I don't see those having been done to these, ve- to this vehicle. I don't, I don't see, we, we don't see him driving. So we don't know. I don't see him, you know, using other methods, but no. Okay. All right, we're that's rolling. We're just ro- we're ro- <laughs> like a wheelchair. Oh, I'm sorry. That is... <laughs> I may cut that part oh. out. I may not. Okay, so they're sitting in this in in this in this 
truck, car, van, whatever the fuck this is. Mm -hmm. And Patrick comes out. Oh. And he gets totally like just knocked down, hit by this sports car, like bad, like knocked the fuck out of him. Like, look, he did on the road. And the driver of the sports car jumps out and like runs to go check on him. He's got like some fucked up like wound in his neck. I don't even know what's going on with that. They try to make a big deal about it. And I was like, that's weird. But the driver runs off to like yell for help to some like road workers down the street that didn't even notice this happened. It's very weird. And just leaves his car there with keys in it and everything. But Patrick ain't dead because he's a fancy witch. And he he just hops in that motherfucking sports car and drives away. I like Patrick. (laughs) And Dean does too. Uh, So um, they follow him to like this condo type place. um, And of course they're like, okay, well now we're going to go search his place because he leaves. So they're like, oh cool. He's gone. We can go search his place. And they suddenly just know which room he's in. I don't know how that, that worked, but okay. But it's like on the 37th floor or some insanity. And the, and could weird. it be the third floor that 3701 is, it was 3701 but you could certainly have 3701 be on a third floor but yeah theoretically i couldn't I, mean, I certainly couldn't fly the climb 37 flights of stairs i don't think sam could and certainly dean could not in the stage he was so, rough and so and Bobby couldn't join at all because the elevator was broke. So they get they break into this con this condo, and there is a lot of lit candles. This is like a major fire hazard, right? Right. It's it's like, either somebody's there, or this is a massive fire hazard. My immediate thought would be somebody is there, right? If you walk into yeah. a place and candles are still lit, and like nobody's, t- and not like oh, I accidentally left the one candle on a table lit. Like we're talking about like dozens of candles. Yeah. You don't just like, oopsie, I forgot to blow those out. Yeah. This is a bad idea. Bad idea. And a lot of them have like, been burning for a while. They have like all the uh, wax, wax dripping, dripping everywhere. Down. Yeah. This is just, it is impractical and not, it's not good in any situation. I guess you're a witch and you can control whether or not things burn. But yeah. So they break into his safe and they start grabbing chips because they find the safe pretty easily. And, um, woman walks in the woman a woman appears behind them and it's leah uh that it actually happens to be the woman that was at the bar with the older gentleman in the previous scene when dean confronted what? patrick she was the what? plant what and she asks what are you doing and she's got magic so she makes them hurt a lot but then patrick shows up and tells her to stop calls them harmless hmm and then says that it's all about the 900 year old witch, mm-hmm. which would make Patrick born around 1100. Hmm. So let's talk about another really old Irish witch. Let's talk about oh. the Kilkenny witch oh. in lore. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we need Cass again. Because you're going back to the 1200s. Like, why did you put away your velvet? You should have just left it out. But, you know, all right, fine. Just get it back on. All right, we're there again. There will not be any cat butts this time. Sorry. We are going to talk about Dame Alice Kittler, a.k.a., as I said, the Kilkenny witch. And hopefully I will not start doing a really bad Irish accent during this during this story. It happens. I'm a mimic. I had two random people think I was from Belfast when I was in England. Like random strangers on the street thought I was from Belfast. I had been in Scotland, so I don't understand how they thought I was from Ireland, but they did. (sighs) Anyhow, so Kilkenny is a municipal district because it can't be a city Because historically, in the UK, only the crown could designate something as a city. So there are cities in the UK that only have like a couple thousand people in them because the crown said they're a city. Isn't that weird? Yeah. It's it's weird. So it is in the southeast of Ireland. And in the 13th century, it was a thriving merchant town, even if the land had been rocked by the recent Scottish invasion. I am not going to attempt to understand or explain the politics of Ireland at this time because they had 
stopped having like their high kings, but now they were part of England, but they weren't part of England. It's very confusing. And we're going to talk about politics a little bit, but not in that way. So mm-hmm. just know Ireland, 13th century. The town is bookmarked by two large buildings. One is the Kilkenny Castle Fortress, and the other is St. Kinesis. I don't know if that's right, but whatever. Cathedral. And that is the seat of the Bishop of Ossory. So Alice Kittler was a member of the Kittler family, go figure, who were wealthy Flemish merchants who had migrated to Kilkenny sometime in the 13th century. And Alice was born there sometime during that century as well. And she turned her large house into an inn. And within this inn, she employed ladies to help her run it and help entertain the wealthy gentlemen of Kilkenny. I do not understand how far that entertainment went however the wealthy man could have have been like hooters level could have been like madame lou's level we just we just i don't know but the the wealthy men like to go there which also helped her meet husbands and also make connections with you know people in the town so she's a well-off lady to begin with because she comes from this family of of merchants right she's got her business and she marries william outlaw what a great name, right? Yeah. Outlaw. But Outlaw actually wasn't an outlaw. He was also a wealthy merchant. And so they get married in the 1280s. And sadly, he dies. Hmm. And we don't know how. However, when he dies, Alice does receive a third of his estate as a widow. And she also has that merchant money from her family and the end. So she's doing pretty okay. She and William had had a son together. His name was also William. And he also does well for himself, basically becomes Alice's business partner. They are very tight for for mother and son. And he goes and basically takes over the dad's business and he starts making political connections, just like his mom does. So they become really tight with the royal administration. And like I said, the politics is slightly confusing, but there is a royal administration that's just Ireland, right? And William is doing so well, he even becomes the mayor of Kilkenny, right? So, but Alice is maybe lonely, horny, we don't know. She decides to get married again. And she marries Adam Leblund of Calan. And he also had cash. He and Alice, however, were accused of murdering her first husband, and she does get slightly accused of witchcraft, but it's just like a little, just a little bit. witchcraft accusation. Just, just a little, just a little, little, little witch. Bit. You're a little witch. But that doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. And in 1307, Adam does something called quit claiming to William, which I learned is some legal term that still exists Mm -hmm. and it basically means that you're forgoing any debt between you and that person and i'm gonna give you shit so like not actual shit but like you know my land and stuff Mm -hmm. so he then adam dies (laughs) and we don't know how he dies but the the theory is that he died from drinking too much because he had a problem but alice not not a lady to be let down rallies and she marries again oh and she it's marries an optimist and a, and, and a romantic looking for love you just you gotta have that special someone in your life so she marries richard de valley in 1309 and she don't want no scrubs mm. he's also rich nice and from a prominent family mm. but he dies too oh no so this is the third husband that's died. Yeah. And then Do people start getting suspicious son, at this point. Particularly the kids of the people she's marrying who right. were getting cut cut out of, of wills some of their inheritance oh. of, of wills. And yeah. the money is going to Alice and William, but also like they're kind of dicks. Like so Richard's son doesn't want to give Alice that her widow share, right? So she's entitled to a third of her husband's estate, which is just <laughs> shitty. Like, oh, she only gets a third? Like, I'm sure, like, half of that shit was probably Alice's money, right? She was already a wealthy, like, right. a wealthy merchant. So maybe she wanted more money, which is fine, girl. You know, have your money, but get an upgrade, right? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, like, 
Ooh, what you doing, girl? What, what's, what's going on here? Why, why are all these men dying? So she sues him and she does get her, her rightful share of that money, but that doesn't leave good feelings between them. And while Kilkenny is a prosperous town, it's still not that large, especially amongst these, you know, the wealthy. But also, Alice just can't be alone. Oh, no. She, she's a serial monogamist. And she marries again. Huh. And she marries for the fourth time to Sir John Le Poor, who was not poor. He was, an, he was a sir. And he starts to get sick. Huh. And That's weird. When he's getting sick, his children also at that time learn that they have been cut out of their inheritance. And that is going to William and Alice. And she's, so, I say, player game strong. She's making bank. She's <laughs> making bank. Dang. And apparently, you know, likely an attractive woman because she keeps, you know, snagging men. I'm mean, sure her money didn't hurt, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. But they're all but dying. They, haven't they seen the trend here? Like the odds of getting her money are pretty slim. But they must think she's worth it, right? I mean, so yeah. when John starts to get sick and the kids realize that they're losing their money, they get together with the kids of her previous husbands ah, and they start chatting. Smart. And they're like, hey, something, something's up over here. And they're like, hey, you know what we should do? This, we this should bitch go to the sketch. Bishop. That's what they said. That's what they said. said. She's sketch. She's and also we want our money is yeah. probably more of B- what the bitch better have my were. money. I mean, that... bitch better have my money. So the kids decide to take their suspicions to the bishop, uh-uh. Richard D. Ledred, L E D R E D E, and that means leatherhead. So we're going to call him Dick Leatherhead. So like Dickhead, but with a leather in it. So huh. Dick Leatherhead. Because he's a bishop. And guess what? Bishop in the 13th century. Kind of sucked. Shocking. So he was also not a local. He was not a charming Irish lad. No, no, no. He was English. He was appointed bishop to uh, the Bishop of Ossory in 1317 by Pope John the 22nd who was terrified that witches were going to kill him. Oh, fun. So the Pope that he comes from already was fucking afraid of witches. And before that, we don't really know a ton about him besides the fact that he was from England and that he worked his way up through the Franciscan order. Likely he came from not, not a poor family, but not like a wealthy family, right? And we do know that he had been in Avignon during the Templar trials when they were burned for heresy. And that is a strong oversimplification of what happened to the Templars in France. There's a lot of shit on that. Go watch Dan Brown or something, whatever. So, but he really got into this. He was like, yeah, you're burning people because they're, they're, her- they're heretics. Like it. So That's when he gets jam. This- it's my jam. I'm into this. Like, yeah, let's let's do this for Jesus. So he comes to town and he tells anybody, hey, if you know of any heretics, tell me. You gotta can you let me know? But you have to let me know in a month. It wasn't really he didn't ask. He was very adamant. Very strict. You need to tell me where they are and you have a month. I I also don't understand why the month. Hmm. Like, let's give them some time to think about it. Well, but, but if you know, you know. Right? You should... But maybe you have a conscience, and that's why it takes you a while. Whatever. Mm. So, he gets to town, and he does that, and then he also thinks that everyone... Because he's a zealot, right? Well, yeah. He wants everyone to be super pious, and certainly doesn't want them to singing body songs. Oh, no. Mm. So... How dare you have fun in a tavern? Right? Especially if you're of the church. So just to make sure, he wrote a book of hymns for, this is the quote for, this is what he wrote. For the vicars of the cathedral church, for the priest and for his clerks, to be sung on important holidays and at celebrations in order that their throats and mouths consecrated to God may not be polluted by songs which are lewd, 
secular and associated with revelry. And since they are trained singers, let them provide themselves with suitable tunes according to what these sets of words require. Huh. He's fun at parties. Yep. And also probably fits really great in with Ireland. Yeah. They don't like to get drunk and sing at Mm. all. No, no. It's not anything they're into in the slightest. Never. So when he gets brought these accusations against Alice, he's stoked. Mm -hmm. It's like, yes, I knew it. There's her radical sorceresses in Kilkenny. And I do love that they don't really call her a witch. They call her a sorceress. And that's so much better. Like, fuck yeah. Like, well, I mean, they knew she was a baller. So, I mean, what do you want? She's like, no, she's just not, she's not a common witch. She's not a kitchen witch. She's not a plant witch. She's a sorceress. So he's <sighs> he's very excited. And so they get together and they talk. I'm like, well, you know, it's not just Alice. Because no, cause we said before, nobody worships Satan alone. She's got to have friends. Yeah. So they end up accusing 10 people besides her, including her son, William. So he's got to be in the mix. Her son, William, is there. And then also... Her poor maid. Oh, that's you just did not want to be a maid to somebody in the 13th century. It does not end well for no, you. No, never. That's and that may be a spoiler to the story, but it does not. So she gets a, and not only is she accused, but also her daughter is. So like her and her fucking daughter are this now like in like this web of oh, clearly they're part of her coven, yeah, right? Obviously, obviously, and they get seven charges first. They are charged with the fact that they denied the Christian faith for a time, for a year or a month. A mo- again, it's or a month. So, you say, if and, you just had like a rough like month of like bad faith, then like they'll fuck you. Yep, yep. So they stopped believing in the doctrines of Christ. They did not adore the body of Christ. I mean, those abs were pretty ripped. Nor did they enter a sacred building or take communion or use holy water. So I'm not sure if they just stopped going to church and because they had shit to do or if they were, they were too busy church. cleaning this bitch's house. Right. They was like, Oh God, do you see how the people in this end? God, they're so messy. Mm. Their second charge was that they sacrificed uh, animals to the demon Robin, son of art or Robert artisan or Phyllis Phileas artist, which is the bastard son of artists. So, According to the Dictionary of Demons, Artis was a great duke of hell. He appears wearing two crowns. Fuck yeah, you rock that. Yeah. You get two crowns. Why one crown when you can wear two? Yeah, right? I mean, that's fair. And he has a sword. He's got he all likes, the accoutrements. He, his accessories are bitchin'. Then he likes to teach and he will answer any questions you ask. He grants love and grace to all persons and has 36 legions of lesser spirits to serve him. Artist sounds like an awesome demon. I want to say this isn't, this, I'm like, this, they're not, they're not like making, selling this as being a negative. No, he does not sound bad. But they're not actually hanging out with artists or hanging out with his son either Robert or Robin, depending on which translation uh, you were going with. Oh. So number third chart is they hung out with demons because, you know, clearly number four, they would meet nightly and would knowingly mock the power of the church by doing things like making, like just being blasphemous. How dare you? Yeah. By existing. By existing. So number five, uh, they did make a concoction in the skull of a decapitated thief. And their recipe was entrails of cocks sacrificed to demons, okay. herbs, worms, and they had to be horrible worms. They're very specific that it was not horrible good worms. worms, not the good worms. So earthworms, no. What's horrible a bad worm? Worms. I don't know. Horrible. The, the worms that don't pay their taxes. Something just really bad worms. And then they also had dead men's nails. Clothes of boys who had died before baptizing and butt hair. Huh. So they would use this concoction inside the skull. And so I 
can barely keep things in a bowl when I'm mixing it or like I always am like getting the wrong pot on the stove or like when I'm making something and I never judge the volume correctly and I I don't feel like a skull has that much room even if you hollow it out you've got eye sockets you've got a lot of like openings around the ear holes and shit and it's not very seem like they'd be pretty big right Maybe like the horrible worms are really tiny. Yeah, they're like mealworms. I don't know. So their sixth charge was that Al- that was specifically to Alice, and that was she bewitched her husbands to give money to her son, and then she murdered them. And the final charge against them, number seven, was again directly against Alice, and that was that Alice and the demon Robin, son of Art, were lovers, and that is why she was wealthy. Because she was fucking a demon. And so Robin would come to her either as a cat, a shaggy dog, or an Ethiopian. That is the Middle Ages racism. Not mine. But they often would associate demons with, with black men because they sucked. So, but Robin also was not alone. He would bring two friends with him. Hmm. That's nice. These demons were actually taller than Robin. I don't know why they had to say that, but just so you know, they were taller than Robin. Noted. But maybe Robin was really short. Maybe. Maybe. And and one of them also carried an iron rod for something. Okay. Hmm. In addition to these seven charges, uh, Alice was also accused of sweeping the streets at night towards William's house and chanting, to the house of William, my son. Hi, all the wealth of Kikelmi Town. So she was doing sweeping spell, the streets, but doing a spell. But also public service. Right? I'm she, assuming. Can't she get like community thir- service hours for that? Right. 13th century, early 14th century. I'm gross. guessing those seats were, those streets were disgusting. Yeah. Probably covered in Poof. shit and just like everything. Poof. Yeah. Poof. So. Dick Leatherhead, once he hears this, he writes to the Chancellor of Ireland. He says, we must, we must arrest them. But the Chancellor of Ireland was Roger Outlaw. Uh-oh. Remember her first husband? Yeah. William Outlaw? Yeah. So he's her son's uncle. Okay. We're, we're pretty sure. We, we think they were brothers, but but they were a close family. And he's like, um, nah. no. Pass pass and then he basically makes the excuse of well you know you have to be excommunicated for 40 days before you can become arrested Uh and and dick leatherhead is like no you know what fuck you i'm gonna do it myself alice alice you're summoned Uh and she goes peace motherfuckers and she eats out of town because she is a smart woman and she just fucking leaves so she either goes to england or dublin we do know she makes her way to dublin in a minute but right now one of the two but the other 10 people are still in town including william and so william kind of becomes the the brunt of what leather had had has to do now right Mm -hmm. because that's all that's there and so William decides, you know what? I probably need some friends. This is looking kind of bad for me. So he starts gathering some some, some supporters, including Sir Arnold Lepour. Uh-oh. Who is also related to the fourth husband who died, but apparently really dug them. So they probably weren't that bad of people because Arnold was like, nah, I'm, I got your back. And Arnold is the Cineskull, and I'm going to butcher that word for all of this of Kilkenny which is pretty much like the town like administrator okay. it's a high position during this time yeah and he also likely thought that Dick was challenging his authority with this mm. because he is like you know the courts the secular yeah. courts and then you have this religious, religious court, court like saying up in your, that up in your shiz in your town Dick charges William with heresy and with harboring heretics Arnold tries to persuade him that this is stupid and Dick does not listen. So Arnold has him arrested. (laughs) That seems like a reasonable solution. So sure. Oddly enough, Arnold is in jail until past the day of when William was supposed to go to court. So he's there for 17 days and Oh boy, 
is he a fucking martyr and he's a little bitch and he throws a tantrum and he puts the entire diocese under interdict which basically means he takes away church oh fun no you can't have jesus anymore you won't have any sacraments you won't get baptized you won't get married if you die that's too fucking bad you're you can't get buried in the church's consecrated grounds and well, that seems a little silly, maybe in this day and age, at that time where you really thought if these things did not happen, you'd burn oh. for eternity yeah, in it's hell. it's very upsetting. It's, yeah, it's upsetting and terrifying. So it's really a big deal that he does this. Yeah. But he's also such a fucking tool. He goes and he gets a communion wafer and he takes the host in with him into jail and he's like, Christ is in prison too. Doesn't sound very Christ like of him. So eventually he is released of, you know, like seven, he's there for 17 days. And Arnold and everybody is like, hey, can you just kind of, you know, let's make this, we'll take it out through the back. It won't be a big deal. And he's like, oh no, no, bring forth my vestment. So he gets his bishop costume on and he gets all his like clergy friends and shit. And they have a parade from the, from the jail to the church. Oh, and then when he gets to the church, he's like, turns around. He's like, will you, you will appear before me tomorrow. Nah. Nah. Huh. So while William is supposed to do that, Arnold and likely probably Alice as well have been doing some political maneuvering in the back end. And Dick is summoned to the parliament in Dublin to answer for the interdict. Cause they're like, Hey, you can't do that to people. It- Dick summoned. <laughs> <laughs> he was Dick summoned. He was. Um. So because this town is still under no church. And so his, he does Don't not show people's up. People's faith away. That's just rude. You're just being a dick, right? Uh, 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 uh. So Dick refuses to go because he says to get to Dublin, he has to go through Arnold's lands and he thinks that Arnold is going to kill him. Probably not wrong because Arnold, when he was hmm. running for his position, murdered his opponent so he could get the job. Oh, So probably here's a some, justifiable fear. There's some bad motherfuckers. Yeah, they're kind of awesome. I mean, like, so, I'm scared and I don't want any of these things to happen at all. But I'm just saying they're kind of, kind of, kind of cool. Yeah, about sh- crazy sh- shit. shit's happening back here, right? So they go back and we're back in Kilkenny. And so Arnold is, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. So even though he's afraid to go, he sends a proctor in his place to go answer for this. And basically his boss, the archbishop, says, stop being a tool. Uplift this interdict. You're an idiot. Let, let, and don't stop punishing all these people. Let them go to fucking church. Right. Dickwad. It, right. But he also is like, Arnold, you need to apologize. You need to apologize to dickhead. Aww. Which is really something he doesn't want to do, but he does. And he ends up like giving him the kiss of peace, which I just, I just imagine that scene. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> fine fine <laughs> but so after that arnold is like fuck this we're we're taking this bishop to court right so mm-hmm. he brings up a court does not invite dick to come but dick shows up anyways and <laughs> i thought there's jokes here and i don't even have them like i don't even know where to go <laughs> oh dick shows up anyways <laughs> Dick always shows up when you least expect it. So Arnold is like, no, man, I want this. I want this man thrown out of my court. And he starts hurling such classic insults like you're an ignorant, low born vagabond from England. (laughs) Because that's the big insult. There we go. It actually is. You're fucking English. All right. And then uh, he also calls him a vile, rustic, interloping monk with dirty hands. Sounds about right. Which is also, this is, you, Arnold, you're an elitist, right? He's like, mm-hmm. you're poor and your hands are dirty and you're from England. But, I mean. Yeah. 
So, but Dick is like, no, I'm going to get into this court. So once again, he holds up the communion wafer of the host and he's using this as a shield. So nobody would hurt him because if you hurt him while he was holding this, then you're hurting the you body would of all, You were hurting Jesus. Yeah. Dick. Yeah, that's rude. And so it's fun. It's just, uh, what, a, what an asshole. Yeah. All right. So he also wants to read aloud the decree that says that the secular courts have to hand over heretics to the church for trial. And he does offer to read it. So he's also throwing shade. He offers to read Would it. Would you like to me to read the, it for the, you? He's like, look, I mean, you're a knight, so you can probably read a little, but I don't want you to say that you didn't understand it because you couldn't read it. So I'll read it out loud for you. Do you want that? So they're just like uh, bitch fighting back and forth. And so he goes out. And this, so at this time, Alice is in Dublin and she decides that she's going to do a counter mover. And she sues the bishop for excommunicating for her for no reason. And at this time, they summon him and he actually does come to Dublin. And so do Arnold and William. And Arnold starts arguing that the church shouldn't have this type of power in Ireland without basically the king's seal. That we as we shouldn't have to follow this law that the Pope says until we determine as a country or at least our royalty or our monarchy, whatever says that we're doing this. Right. Right. And he says this very kind of poetic thing that's like, it was, I don't know, poetic, but kind of slamming. And he says, as you well know, heretics have never been found in Ireland, which has always been called the Island of Saints. Now this foreigner comes from England and says we are all heretics and excommunicates. Defamation of this country affects every one of us, so we must all unite against this man. So he's throwing his nationalism there and being like, look, if we cow to this guy, we're cowing to the church, and you're taking away our rights as Irishmen. Yeah. Nobody listened because he had a this time while there were people there who were on Arnold and Alice's and William's side, there were also a bunch of bishops there. Mm. So they all decide, no, no, this is your right. Go ahead and accuse Alice and the rest of them. And Alice is like, bye. Bye. <laughs> she, eat, eat again. Eat. She's just like, I'm getting on a boat. So she gets on a boat and goes away. And but back in, again, leaving everybody behind to kill Kenny. Yeah, I'm like, this is not nice of her. Yep, so all those people are arrested. And huh. they they do confess and say, yes, yes, Dame Alice is our mistress of evil. She is our mistress. And William does appear before the bishop. He also brings a bunch of friends with him who are all, like, fucking armed. And they all just kind of stand around, like, while the bishop is accusing him. I'm like, what you gonna do, man? Like, like subtle do? threats, <laughs> subtle threats, which I do, I enjoy quite a lot. And he gets accused of 34 different crimes, but really, it's you know, heresy and being a sorcerer. Blah blah. blah. Mm-hmm. He has to wait for the Justic Harry to come to town, which the Justic Harry, for what I understand, is kind of like the prime minister, head judge. Like, so while our, like I said, the politics of this time are very confusing. While Ireland was a part of the of England, they had their own like the person who was like making like the decisions. Okay. Right. Like their high their high like their president that kind of not I guess, yeah. I, it's confusing, but it's basically high up important people. Right. But appointed, not elected. I believe. Probably. Appointed. Probably. Probably. I don't think they had elections. No. So likely appointed. So, uh, these officials do arrive in Kilkenny, uh, many of them actually staying with William, and Dick knows, though, that this is his moment, right? And he's like, yeah, this is strange. I'm going to read all these charges against Alice, and I'm going to declare her to be a sorceress hmm. and a heretic. She should be handed over by whoever has her, and we should get all her goods. Oh, Alice. oh, convenient. How convenient. They just want to take her stuff. Yeah. So Alice is not handed over because no one knows where Alice is. And if they do, they, they ain't, ain't telling. Nope, nope. Hmm. But they do take her stuff, including her in. So 
civil asset forfeiture is bullshit. Go ahead. Yep, yep, yep. That <laughs> was a thing even then, and it's a thing now, and it's fucking bullshit. So William does confess to his crimes, and he is imprisoned in Kilkenny Castle until the bishop changes his punishment to you have to perform penance. So the penance he is given is you need to hear three masses every day for a year, which is also like you think about the fact that they were giving more than that. There's that many masses a day in your small town. That's a lot of your day. Like three times a day. That's that's a fucking lot. You also have to give food to the poor (sighs) and you have to pay for part of the lead roof for our cathedral. So that is what he's told to do. Okay. Then he doesn't do it. because why would you and he gets put back in prison and then now that alice is gone i mean how are you gonna make money to pay for the lead roof if you're in fucking mass all day (laughs) (laughs) right so the bishop is like well now that william is in prison and alice is gone who do i have left to torture and talk to oh let's start with all these other people i arrested yeah so he demands that Petronilla, the maid, of course, the maid, be flogged six times, which was not basically violated many of the practices of the time. Like you're not supposed to do that. You're not, never supposed to flog anybody, much less six times, which is pretty awful. And somehow, after she was flogged that many times, she confessed a lot. Hmm, that's weird. She said, "Yeah, weird." After somebody like beat the shit out of her, like, she said, "Why? Yes, yeah, you'll say a lot yes. of things." Yeah. Yes, I, I did deny my faith, and I sacrificed to Robert. Yeah, yes, totally. S- totally, I did that. Are you going to Sometime- stop trying to kill me now? That'd be great. Yes. Uh, well, uh, what else do you want to know? Oh, oh, okay. Yes, sometimes I made women of my acquaintance look like they had goat's horns. Huh. Which if I... That is a damn fine use Body of your Body mod, 1300 Patrick style. <laughs> Boom. Oh, ha ha, that bitch has horns. Ha! <laughs> And she also confessed to, yes, I did consult demons and I was a go-between for Alice and Roberts. Why, why, yes, I was a mistress of the black arts, but nothing compared to Alice. Alice taught me everything. Oh, why, why also, yes, William is a sorcerer and he wore the devil's girdle for a whole year. So the devil's girdle, apparently there are many magical girdles, which are basically belts, right? And they appear to have been the origin of the magnetic belts that people sometimes wear today. Okay. But, but apparently, yeah, you if you, like Satan, you wore a belt underneath your shit, I guess, or maybe in the outside. I don't know, but you had a girdle on. And also, yes, there were wafers of sacramental bread with a devil on it in Alice's house. And also, she had ointments. And she put it on a staff. And then she got on that staff and she ambled and galloped around. Huh. Wait, so <laughs> she so she, you, she you, lubed up a stick and wrote it. Yeah. She did. So you can have goat horns, have a, a a satanic girdle that makes you look skinny, and then ride around on a greased up stick. I didn't say it made you look skinny, but I like that you went there. Well, that's right. You're, like, Your girdle. You, said, <laughs> you said girdle. That's like a a fitted thing. I'm like, this just sounds like it's just a belt. Night, it just but sounds yes. like a night at a goth club. Goat goat horns, corset. Riding a st- lubed up stick. Is that Panopticon or whatever they, or whatever they said? We're gonna go to we're gonna go to the church doing that. <gasps> Pretty yeah. much. Yep. All right. So she confesses through all these things, and then she's burned at the stake on oh, November third. So that didn't work out well for her. Did it? it did not. And she was the first person accused of heresy to be burned in Ireland. So really, she was the first witch. To, like the first uh-huh. woman accused of being a witch to be burned this is also the first time where we really start seeing women's sexuality being brought in as part of it like you, the fact that oh you're clearly fucking demons right and that be, as we know will become a very big part of witchcraft accusations for, for the next millennium practically right uh, so but her being burned at the stake did light a fire under William, uh, you could say. Uh, 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 I see what you did uh, there. I did. And so he begs the bishop to come to his prison and he just throws himself in the mud and begs. And Dick says, okay, fine. 
but we need more penance, right? You you can't just have what you need to do more. So you need to get on the first boat that comes around and go to the Holy Land. You need to make a pilgrimage. You need to make a, you need to pay for more of the lead in our roof. And we also think you need a co-signer because we don't believe you're going to do this. Mm. So Roger actually, I'm just calling in the co-signer or was like someone who's paying your bail, basically saying, I will be responsible for William doing this penance. If William does not do this, I will do this in his stead. Oh, that sucks. Uh, But good uncle. Yeah. Good on him. Right. So that is what happens. We think William does that stuff. I don't really know what happens to William, but what about the other accused? And we also don't really know what happened to the rest of the other eight people. Right. There was, I did read somewhere that Sarah, that damn it. The fuck was her name? Her name is not easy to remember. The poor maid, uh, the Petronilla is her. It's a lovely, it's a lovely name, but it's very hard to remember. Petra. We'll just call her that. That's easier. Yeah. Uh, so there there was a rumor that her daughter what actually was with Alice when she fled. I don't know if that's true, but that would be awesome if she took her. If I was going to, yeah. fingers crossed, that's what happened to her. There was a monk at the time who said, with regard to the other heretics and sorcerers who belong to the pestilential society of Robin, son of art, the order of law being preserved, some of them were publicly burnt to death, Others confessing their crimes in the presence of all the people in an upper garment are marked back and front with the cross after they abjured the heresy, as is the custom. Others were solemnly whipped through the town and the marketplace. Others were banished from the city and diocese. Others who evaded the jurisdiction of the church were excommunicated, while others again fled in fear and were never heard of after. And thus, by the authority of Holy Mother Church and by the special grace of God, that most foul brood was scattered and destroyed. I just love the fact they always include son of art. Yeah. Robin. Son of of art. He can't just be, we didn't, maybe there were multiple Robins and we had to be very clear about which Robin this was. Yeah. You know, so of course, Dick doesn't stop and he keeps accusing people and inevitably accuses Arnold of heresy. And unfortunately, Arnold dies awaiting trial at Dublin Castle. I hope he haunts it. So eventually though, Ireland does get sick of Dick shit. And they just toss him out. They toss him out of the country. And also in a fun state of karma is a bitch. He gets accused of heresy. Ah! Ah! Suck it. So that happens to him. He ends up kind of going in and out of favor with the courts of France and, but ends up basically dying without his shit. Uh, they, all his stuff is confiscated and he dies out of favor of the church. So bomb. Also, in 1332, the lead tower of the cathedral collapsed because lead. Hmm. Oddly, I, mean, I don't know. Put... I, I assume that they just were using a lot of lead in a lot of church roofs. So I didn't think anything of it. I'm like, I don't fucking know what they were using to make that shit. So I assumed it was no. Let's let's heavy. let's heavy then, yeah. like it is well, now. I mean, get that. And if you put a bunch of it in a roof, it's gonna yeah. Yeah. Also, probably just not great in general to have that much lead around you. What? But, but Alice, Mm -hmm. Alice was never heard from again. Nice. She just disappeared, and I hope she lived a bitching life and just had like the best fucking time riding her greased up stick. And you can still go visit the Kettler Inn. It's in Kilkenny. It, their menu looks dope, and they have a very interesting video promoting it. Yeah, I recommend, and we will drop the link in our in in the show notes, of course. But highly recommend you go watch this very lengthy, interesting video about the Kettler Inn. And of course, I made Diana watch it. Yep. Thank you, Diana, for. I did. It was. It was. It was something. It was. It was something. Yep. And of course, it is haunted. Uh, They think most likely by Petronilla. It is believed that Alice haunts the staircase at the cathedral, which I also would love if, like, the bishop is haunting it, too, and she's just, like, fucking with him throughout eternity. That would be great. In 2004, uh, Patty Shaw, an American artist, 
painted a portrait of Alice with a representation of the demon Atheops. He eventually sent that to the end with a note that said, Alice doesn't like being with me. You have her. Huh. So I'm not sure what Alice and the portrait was doing to him. And she's honestly, the portrait man, she looks kind of unhappy. So I can see why she was probably pissed off at you. And also the fact that you put that demon in there with her and not a cat. You should have put a cat. All right. And finally, we're going to end with a bit of a poem because it's Ireland. We do, all the Irish, we do love our poets. And so this is an expert, excerpt from William Butler, Butler Yeats, 1919. But now when drops, dust settles, thereupon there lurches past, his great eyes without thought, upon the shadow of stupid straw pale locks, that insolent fiend, Robert Artisan, to whom the lovelorn Lady Hitler brought bronze peacock feathers, Red combs of her cocks. Huh. And that is also because in some of the versions, the things that were sacrificed to bring the animals included the uh, red combs of roosters and peacock feathers. Okay, then. But that's pretty, I mean, the fact that that was written by Yates so much further in time is kind of cool that the legend of her was still the, the something that was being talked about then. And obviously there, like I said, there's a lot of firsts that happen with this story and also just a pretty much demonstration of how much it sucked to live in the 13th and 14th centuries. Not, I'm, I'm not disappointed that I don't live in that time. I, I'm, Yeah. Not not the time period that I would want to personally reside in. But I also like, you know, as much as our timeline sucks, I'm like, I like technology. Yay. So, um, well, yeah. We'll go, Alice. She she knew how to eat. Uh, so we've got our um uh our Brothers have been busted. Our old Dean and young Sam have been busted by Patrick, the 900-year-old witch, and his lady friend, Leah? Sure. Um, and so basically they're like, yeah, the, the chips don't do shit on their own. Sorry. It's all about the witch. And Dean's eyesight is shot, so he's probably not going to be able to... And so his... You know, he's not really going to be great at betting at this point in time he's just not gonna be a great player and uh also as the patrick says i'm not a murderer tries to get sam to play but sam ain't good at poker so they sadly with their heads hung have to leave and give up for the day womp womp and before they're leaving though patrick decides to leave sam with a gift and claps three times by the time we get to the bottom of the stairs sam's junk is real itchy because patrick gave him the clap which is just rude. Anyways, uh, so there, of course, then we've got Sam, Dean, and Bobby arguing because Sam wants to fucking play the game and Dean and Bobby are like, mm, we're good at poker and we fucking lost. This is a terrible plan. And so uh, this is where we get a sad, sad commentary from Bobby and we get a little insight on his mental state. And he says that basically he's like, you know, what am I living for? The apocalypse? I, you know, I'd be fine. You know, I don't really care if I die. Basically I'm broke down. I'm all, hunt I'm not a hunter anymore. I'm useless. And, uh, if I wasn't a coward, I would have stuck a gun in my mouth. And that that's, you know, Sam tells Bobby, like, no, you, you can't play again. We'll just find another way. Then who shows up at their motel, but Leah and she has a fucking spell that she wants to give to them to undo everything that Patrick's done. It will reverse all of their, all, everything that's been done to anybody that's actually alive still will be reversed. And they like, don't really believe her. She's like, look, just it doesn't matter if you believe me or not. I look good for my age. I know what the fuck I'm talking about. Here's the spell, take it or leave it. And she won't really tell them why, but she keeps touching this locket that she's wearing. Uh, but she's like, but you only got till tomorrow, motherfucker. So make up your mind. And she disappears. Then we see, you know, Sam does show up at another poker game. And Patrick is playing with an older gentleman. Um, and the guy folds and he's up 13 years. So somebody actually did win a few years. 
But Sam's like, all right, let's deal. Let's do this. I'm going to play. And, I, and as a viewer, you're kind of like, oh, fuck. Did Dean and Bobby know that he's going for this? But we cut to Dean and Bobby in a graveyard. And Dean, old Dean, does not dig up graves as well as young Dean. He has some struggle bus going, but he's doing it anyways. Um, so now we learn that, like, so now we're kind of seeing that case okay, so of Dean and Bobby are off on the mission to do the spell because why else would they be in the goddamn graveyard? Uh, Patrick is trying to mind fuck Sam and doesn't really like, like Sam, like you can't really tell if he's fallen for it or not. Um, but it doesn't seem like he is. So at some point, um, Dean, Sam keeps watching Patrick put this toothpick down and they're zooming in on it. And so you're like, Oh, I better pay attention to the toothpick. And he kind of rotates them out. Well, finally we they take a break from the poker game and Sam rushes the toothpick out to the alley where Dean and Bobby are waiting in the van to do the spell and hands over the toothpick because apparently they needed Patrick's DNA. So they go to do the spell. They drop the toothpick in and nothing happens. So Patrick calls Sam out. Patrick knew that it was a toothpick that he didn't put in his mouth. So it didn't have his DNA on it. And he is pissed. Uh, and so he starts doing a magic strangle on Sam. So, but this woman, Leah, she's, she's there. She shows up and she's like, no, I gave them the spell. So it's my fault. Don't, you can't really be mad at him or blame him for this shit. And she, he's like, what the fuck? But so she's she fingers, this locket again. And I'm kind of like, I'm going to say that even at the end of this, I still like, think she kind of talks about like like why but they do because like not go in depth on this i mean it's a really implied sub story as to why she turns on patrick in my opinion but they said they continue the poker game at her insistence um so dean and bobby are like well we'll just go to the freaking condo and try to find some dna there because obviously the toothpick didn't work which is also like that's they know that everything else is in the spell is right and i'm like well are you sure everything else is right i mean i know we know but that's really like strong deduction to decide that um patrick continues playing the card game with sam though and it's just really mind fucking him but sam manages to bluff pretty effectively and and wins and he's like mm, yeah well dean's about to be dead though and so sam tries to leave he's like no no the game's not over sorry you have to stay and we're getting like the cut back and forth which is really hard to like talk to talk through but right when dean's about to be able to grab this wine glass which would have dna on it he collapses and it's a little distressing but also like I don't know. Do you watch Supernatural? Who dies this week? Okay. But they, um, so he's obviously having some kind of a heart attack and he's been on the phone with Bobby during all of this. Patrick kind of calls Sam out though for getting emotional when anything has to do with his brother and thinks that Sam is fucking the game up. But Sam's like, fuck that. I'm going all in. And Patrick doesn't believe he's doing good, but right when... Dean is dying on the floor of Patrick's condo and Sam, it looks like he's about to lose and Leah's crying and Sam tells her it's so nice. It's kind of creepy. And right then Dean busts out the great hand, not really, but a good hand, but just enough to win. And Patrick's impressed and Sam cashes in his chips for Dean. Yay! But is it in time? <gasps> Young Dean walks downstairs to meet Bobby. Yay! It was just in time. And he does a little bell jump. Like you know, the jump where you jump and click your heels. It's pretty amazing. So, um, but now um, we, we get a conversation between Patrick and Leah. And this is kind of sad. I don't know. I We figure out she's she wants to play a game against him, of cards against him she's ready to be done with life and they don't i didn't really truly catch how long they were together but you knew it was a long time and she talks about how she buried her you know buried her daughter who 
aged and like it just wasn't natural and it's not natural for her to be this young and it's just he's like but this is what you wanted she's like it was but i miss family and i love you but i'm just not cut out for this and so the way i pieced it together i mean obviously they're i think it was they felt like what i'm and correct me if i miss something on this but basically he's this you know powerful ass witch and she's got some witchy skills or he taught her some witchy shit but they fell in love he's like i'll make you live forever and look young forever with me we'll live forever young but she had a kid and her kid didn't have that same opportunity so she stays young forever with patrick looking looking hot and doing whatever but her kid aged and all of everybody she knew and all her family and friends and everything aged and died. And she's still just like looking young, running around the world with Patrick. And she got sad and tired of it. Is that what they were implying? And th- is that how you read it? Yeah. Okay. I'm making sure. Because it does sound depressing. Like, I don't like being old. That does sound awful after a while. Um, But it's so symbolic as they finish their game of cards. He sets down on going all in and he sets down a king and a queen and definitely beats her hand because her hand was garbage and then she starts aging and and she dies she did she did so at the motel bobby is super impressed that sam actually beat patrick at cards um and um and then we get kind of a nice conversation as um Sam leaves to go get a booster shot for his clap. But Dean and Bobby have a really important conversation here. And Dean's like, look, I I was a little bit aggressive with you, but Bobby's like, well, I don't want pity. And he's like, no, they have this really important exchange. I think though, where Dean explains where, how he sees Bobby and how important Bobby is to them. Not just, he's like, you know, as far as being like a hunter and apocalypse shit or whatever, he's like, well, you don't stop being a soldier because you're wounded in battle. Okay, fine. Yeah, give him purpose. That's fine. But also, it's like your family. We don't have much left and we can't do it without you. So don't, please don't think about checking out again. And, um, and then Bobby says that agrees and is agreeable. But then he says, you know, are we done feeling feelings here? And then the eye roll about, we're going to start growing lady parts. Hmm. But yeah. Oh, yeah, we leave on a, other than like an eye roll comment, we definitely end on an emotional development for Bobby. So, um, a few casting notes from this week. Casting couch is the casting couch. Were they on that show that time with that guy? We have uh, a few interesting actors here. And um, so Old Dean uh, was played by Chad Everett. Um, He passed away in uh, 2012, actually. Uh, And uh, he was uh, Simon in Airplane 2. So he's been acting for a long time. Makes sense, older gentleman. Uh, He was Jimmy in Mulholland Drive. Um, And uh, what was it? Um, Liz, you found like he like pissed off Lily Tomlin on a set once by referring to his wife as property and stormed off. Yeah, he was an old fashioned, Holly, really like he's been acting since the 60s. Yeah. So just a very old, old, not, well, I mean, he was old, but I guess yeah. that's the point. But. He was, he was from a different time. Um, Patrick was played by Hal Ozsen, is what I'm guessing how you pronounce it. Um, he's from uh, Cyprus. He has a band uh, named Poets and Porn Stars that was seen in a lot of, uh, been, the music's been used in a lot of shows as well. Uh, he played Ramsey in Infidel, the movie. He was in one episode of Lucifer. Um, he played Navid in Bad Teacher. Uh, he uh, played King Charles II in, in one episode of True Blood. Uh, he, his, uh, he was Todd, which is a reoccurring character on Dawson's Creek. And um, one of his first film roles was he was a concierge in Al Pacino filmed Simone, where it, where it has nu- numerals in it. Yeah. And then Leah was played by Pascal Hutton. Um, she's done a lot of like single um, episode roles. 
including two episodes of Fringe and two episodes of Once Upon a Time as uh, Princess Gerda. So that's what we got. Yeah. So any final thoughts on the episode? No, I think that's it. I mean, like we said, I think it was important development for Bobby and um, the relationships in the episode. But it also, um, you know, there wasn't like, and it was an enjoyable monster, but it wasn't necessarily like a, a massive plot mover. And it wasn't like a Bummersville, which is great. <laughs> that's always, yay. So there we go. All right, then. I guess that'll wrap it up for this episode. Oh. Cheers, jerk. Cheers, bitch. Devil's Trap Podcast is a don't get a production. Meow. Devil's Trap Podcast is part of the Ship It Studio Podcast Network. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Devil's Trap Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Devil's Trap Podcast, Twitter at Devil's Trap Pod, or you can email us at Devil's Trap at Devil's Trap Podcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe, leave reviews, and share with all your friends. We're at all your favorite podcast outlets and at devilstrappodcast.com. I'm Babe. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time. Devil's Trap Podcast.